So I think a key issue is just how how we judge whether uh, whether housing is good. Like, is it judged just on finance? Is it something that that sells? Is it something where you can definitely find somebody that moves in? And the answer is, of course, you can sell things. Of course, people will move in. There's a housing crisis. There's a huge shortage. The the issue is, can we aim higher and have uh, housing that um, makes people feel better, improves mental health, that lets them adjust their space to their own needs, that um, allows them to meet their neighbours? And I think it's it's letting these values also have a value to the people responsible for building, that it isn't just uh, a financial unit or a unit of investment. It's it's place that impacts people's lives in an enormous way. Working with artists, uh, it gave an opportunity to question some of the assumptions around housing uh, that are unhelpful. Um, so there's, for example, an assumption that absolute privacy and social isolation is necessary or inevitable and we our position was that it, it's not um, and that there's huge benefits to counteracting loneliness to have positive communal spaces and I think working with artists uh, it also gave us a way to communicate about the project differently that we could uh, say yeah artists need uh, good lighting artists need adaptability artists need um, big living rooms, so I suppose things that everybody needs, everybody would enjoy, uh, but working with artists uh, was a way of communicating the importance of these things in a context where there's so many assumptions about what you need in housing, and it's, it's, it was almost like a foregone conclusion about what housing is, and talking about what artists need gave a way of opening that up again. I think housing um, is a process, uh, it's, a, it's a political process, it's an economic process where you have land, you have people, um, and you have to build to house those people, right? Um, and there are very well established routes in terms of who buys the land, who owns the land, and who finances the build. So that's all obviously the most fundamental part. But a way of thinking about that has emerged, at least in Britain, in the recent decades, whereby um, the end result doesn't really matter, i.e. the building, right? So it had basically been relegated to having no importance, right? And so a lot of effort was put into um, making the first part somehow work primarily for people who aren't going to live in the building, right? Be it as an investment, whatever it is, right? So I guess... It's important to say that actually the purpose of housing, housing process is the end result. So therefore it has to be centred rather than a kind of peripheral, almost accidental outcome. When cities have space, like excess space and empty warehouses, those have often coincided with being a particularly good time to work as an artist when you're, you have access to space. And that's something that no longer exists in London. We don't have, there's no, there's no excess, there's no give, there's no spaces to live cheaply uh, or have a, have a studio cheaply. Um, the options are incredibly reduced now. So as an artist, you still have to find a way to earn money. It's very hard for you to focus on your practice. Um, artists uh, have an extremely low income. And so it, it does put them into an income bracket that 
would necessitate uh, social housing. Um, and I think there's sometimes there's a, a critique uh, around artists moving into an area of, say, gentrification. And our view is that the gentrification is not the fault of the artists, but it's how well everyone else is protected against increasing rents. So if everyone else has good rental contracts and are protected, it doesn't matter if the area gets more expensive, they, would, they wouldn't lose their home. I think the issue is what protections do we give to people? And it's in this particular case, we're also not talking about artists coming in from elsewhere. Actually, half the artists are from the local area. So they're already part of the community. It isn't, um, it isn't like they're coming in from, from outside. Um, and I think that's also quite important that this, the fact that the building is embedded in the community, it's for the community. There's, there's, uh, the community are invited into the building to take part in, in uh, all kinds of uh, uh, activities that are, are led by the artists. So it's, there's a real sharing between the building and the surrounding neighbourhood. Yeah, we have a, a hotter climate here than we used to, and it's, it's only going to get worse. Um, a lot of buildings overheat terribly. I think 55% of homes are at risk of overheating as it stands, and that's going to increase. Um, and the answer can't be aircon everywhere. And that means the way that we design buildings from scratch has to take it into consideration. Um, so we shouldn't really have single aspect homes that can't be ventilated properly. Um, we need to be able to cool homes down overnight uh, with natural ventilation. And what we have in House for Artists is, is a, a um, shared balcony that uh, shades the windows in summer um, but lets the sun in in winter so the the deck is is a, a passive measure in keeping uh, the apartments cool in in summer um, and I think it's really measures like that it's it's also much more than a thermal measure it's also allows a, a different way of living a kind of shared space to enjoy the outside temperature we're not fighting against it but rather that it's a it makes for a pleasant way to experience the outside um, with your neighbors um, and I think that was quite important to us that it's um, that it's an architectural device that 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 connects people mm. as well as responding to issues around climate the climate has changed here um, and is changing. And so, of course, we have a warmer climate and so the peaks are higher. But new build buildings themselves are generating a lot of heat. So, for instance, the centre of a building will be a corridor and that corridor will be loaded with um, uh, mechanical devices. And those will generate heat and so you end up with a very hot core to the building. And then either side you'll get apartments whereby there's direct sunlight c coming in. So the combination of those two things with nowhere for the heat to go means that British buildings are reaching late 30s uh, on, on a day that's not even hot, you know, where people can't sleep, they can't perform properly during the day. Um, and, the, and the number of properties or number of homes that, um, that suffer that is, is, is very high, surprisingly high. Um, but the other thing we'd say is that we, when we're designing, um, we're like we like any architect, we're very interested in, in, in um, a kind of history of architecture as, a, as habitats that humans make around the world, right? And there's actually fantastic similarities between uh, different parts of the world. And so we always think that actually we can learn beyond boundaries, right, so somehow. Um, and of course, the exact climate here isn't exactly the same as Brazil, say, for instance, but there are things you can still learn in terms of um, uh, performance. And then like Astrid says, the great thing is what comes with that is, is, is another way to make buildings more sociable. 
And that's what we find very interesting, this sort of link between modulating your environment better often in increases social interaction. So for us, it's, it's definitely a scalable project. And I think where we'd pay attention is to how, how many units are sharing one balcony, for example, that you wouldn't have eight. You want it to be possible for communities to form. So uh, clusters of three or four units, but you can still achieve a high density with that. Um, and in general, there's no particular reason why it, it shouldn't be scalable. It fits within cost norms, space norms, regulatory norms. So, so it really, it it is possible. It is scalable, and and also, it's working incredibly well. <laughs> like it's it's having um, the feedback from the residents has been incredible, and I think it's. Perhaps again to come back to the earlier question about you know, how do we how do apartments get valued like how do you measure success of apartments and and I think in terms of this becoming a, a replicated model it would be about starting to look at those other or applying a, a value to to those other less tangible qualities like uh, combating loneliness mental health. Things that aren't as measurable as finance, uh, and and recognizing that it's it's working and it's it's not a it's not a risky model. This is a housing model that is working really well. I think if something fits within all, in in all the norms, it's scalable, right? Um, it just comes down to establishing norms. How are norms established, right? And, and norms have been established. Um, by a certain sector of the market for decades. Actually, there's nothing wrong with that sector of the market. It's just, it's grown so big to be a kind of monoculture. So perhaps we need a more diverse housing production line where you get bigger percentages of other forms of housing being provided. And that mix will be a way to change the norms. And then once those norms are changed, then things are scalable. I think housing already has superseded a lot of local contexts. You see similar, similarly bad models replicated across the world. And I think that's where, in a sense, you could uh, also do similarly good models across the world. And this, this project, it, it borrows architectural elements from warmer climates because we now have a warmer climate. And I think in that sense, I think it could work in, in multiple places. And of course, there's all, you'll always have to respond to the local context as well. I think there was a, there was a, let's call it, there was a scaled up model, which is the kind of flat facade tower with windows and uh, a core in the middle. Um, and it's kind of universal, low-grade modernism, whereby everything is fixed with a machine. Uh, it, the, where, whether, whether there's not enough air deep in the building, or if it's too hot, or if it's too cold, a machine will always fix it. So that became the thing that got applied globally everywhere, right? Here, Brazil, etc. cetera. Um, and so, yeah, I think there is, un, there is an unfortunate similarity between housing blocks all over the world. Um, and that's something to do with people believing it's somehow either back then a better image of the future. We're going to live in a, uh, a machine that has machines in, but also, of course, there's vested in or there's there's interest in, in it in as much that it was seen as being uh, quicker and cheaper to coordinate and build. And it's actually not necessarily the case. Um, so yeah, so we we we're, we're very in interested in how people build all over the world as a way to learn about how to build in sp more specifically.
We also think on the one hand, it's very important to look at how humans build their habitats around the world to learn from, but we also have to recognize when it doesn't work. So one is to say that these, these kind of flat modernist blocks, which rely on machines, doesn't work. But we can also say that some post-war housing didn't work, but some did, right? I think the bigger issue is that architects of a particular type, say good architects who are ambitious, um, basically no longer worked in the housing market since the, the 1980s, effectively. So you could easily go, right, you could go to Britain, you could go to India, go to Brazil and say, okay, it's 1985, who are the great architects? Let's get them doing mass housing. They just weren't because they were excluded from that process. So the good architects have always been there. They just were not, see because, because of the final result of the building being for people was taken out of the equation effectively. It meant that, I think that caused a lot of problems. And, and the most important thing is to get great architects into the market, into the housing market. And like that, a lot of issues will be uh, resolved. I think some people find that a silly or hilarious thing to say uh, in some ways, but I think it's important because actually good buildings in the end don't cost more and the long-term benefits are enormous. Uh, there's a kind of political shift uh, which happened through the 80s and 90s glo globally. Um, er I mean, we can, I'm not saying it's particularly good or bad, but a particular way of viewing the economy and structuring the economy emerged. And I'm not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad. But what I'm saying is part of that global shift was a big shift in uh, housing pol 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 policy. Everyone decided that housing was not a problem. Okay, fine. Maybe it wasn't a problem then. It was, but you know, we can say it's not. And then if that policy stayed in place for 40 years, then we have a problem that was created 40 years ago. It's right at the beginning um, and we don't know yet what form it's going to take. And if we just do more of what is already done, then we're just going to keep recreating the same problems that housing has. So for it to really be a new era, there needs to be a different approach to design, to finance, who's responsible, who is seen as the end client. Because the end mm. client should really be thought of as the people that live there, not shareholders. And I think there needs to be a shift in a lot of thinking for a new era in council building to really be successful.